All right, welcome everyone. This is the lecture for the week of November 22nd. And today we're gonna to be discussing the interface between Irish nationalism and feminism in the early 20th century. And this is an especially fascinating time period because while Irish independence is indeed heating up and Republican movements and groups are taking shape uh, and eventually taking up arms uh, to rebuke British rule in Ireland, uh, women's movements are also developing and women are beginning to assert their presence into the political atmosphere of countries around the world, uh, not just in Ireland, but across the Western world, really. Uh, we know from US history that the early 20th century really saw the development of the suffrage movement uh, and in Britain and Ireland at the time, this is taking place as well. Uh, and I've titled this lecture actually, Citizens First and Women After. And I've pulled the title of this lecture from a speech given by a woman named Constance Markovich, who was a prominent Irish nationalist activist uh, from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Markovich is probably most well known for her role in the Easter Rising when um, Irish nationalist groups took arms against British presence in Ireland and had a week long occupation of multiple government buildings in Dublin. Uh, it is thought that Markovich herself actually shot a British police officer in this uh, rising. And she is also known as being the first woman elected to serve in the Westminster Parliament. Now, because of her role in the 1916 rising, she never actually took her seat. She was serving a prison sentence uh, when her seat in Parliament uh, was supposed to be occupied. Uh, nonetheless, she is a very uh, well-known Irish nationalist activist, also known for her dedication to serving Irish, the Irish poor. Um, so this being said, Markovich uh, was regularly engaged in giving speeches and encouraging people to join the nationalist movement, uh, especially her fellow women. Um, she wanted to address them in a way that would not only lend the nationalist movement legitimacy, but give women the specific space uh, and serve as a catalyst to join the, the movement itself. So I wanna give a quick recap of a speech she gave in her home county of Sligo, uh, just to kind of give you the full picture of what her rhetoric and what her approach to Irish nationalism is. is. Uh, and I'm pulling this actually from Anne Haverty's 1988 biography of Markovich. Uh, it is only one of five biographies uh, to ever be published on Markovich. I found it fascinating that all but one of her biographers are women. This kind of demonstrates the impact that Markovich herself has had on the uh, historical conscience of Irish women. So just a glimpse of the kind of rhetoric she was using in her speeches. Let's have a quick look. She states, um, you must make Irish goods as necessary to your daily life as your bath or breakfast. For if women would only make the fashion to dress in Irish clothes, to feed on Irish food, to live really Irish lives, they'd be doing something great. You must make the world look upon you as citizens first and women after. For each one of you, there is a niche waiting, your place in the nation. Try and find it. And maybe as a leader, and maybe as a humble follower, perhaps in a political party, perhaps in a party of your own, but it is there. Um, so in this quote, she's really demonstrating uh, not only for women to be involved in the nationalist movement holistically, saying that you need to be eating Irish food and wearing Irish clothing and living truly Irish lives, she's also suggesting that uh, political issues like suffrage and issues more specific to women uh, need to be a second place priority and that the needs of the nation have to come first so we can better serve those of women. Now, politically active women in Ireland obviously had a multitude of interests and endeavors, um, but when it came to feminism and nationalism, there's observable pressure from both of these ideologies for women to kind of pick one or the other when it comes to directing uh, their energy as activists. So not to say that women uh, could not support both causes. Markovich herself was a patron and advocate of women's rights and suffrage herself, but in her own words, she believes that the needs of the nation have to come first, uh, that independence from Britain was her top priority, and she believed other women should think the same. Um, you know, both creeds needed people who were willing to throw all their energy behind either independence from Britain 
or the advancements of women's rights to vote. So uh, to balance out Markovich a little bit, I want to introduce you guys to another woman. Her name is Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, and she's actually the founder of the Irish Women's Franchise League. Uh, this organization was set up in Dublin in 1908. And while Sheehy Skeffington herself was born into a very Republican family uh, and was supportive of nationalist causes in her personal life, she described herself as uh, a feminist above all. So this being said, she's almost antithetical to Markovich in that she believes uh, the needs of women need to be addressed before the nation can really pursue independence properly, if that makes sense. Um, and this kind of just demonstrates how the complex relationship between Ireland and Britain uh, impacted all of Ireland's domestic affairs, not just ones pertaining to uh, nationalism, but also ones pertaining to uh, women's roles as well. And this leads us to the question of, well, how hand in hand were British suffragettes and Irish suffragettes? And the answer to that is complicated, but the, you know, point is that they coexisted and they had similar philosophies, but that harmonious unity that you would expect between two groups like that was obviously not there because of that complex colonial relationship between Britain and Ireland, and the fact that many of the suffragettes, like Sheehy Skeffington herself, were in fact nationalists who wanted independence, who wanted women to vote on Irish affairs, not vote um, towards something taking place in Westminster. So Ireland has had, you know, subordinates to England even since the Middle Ages, you know, the Norma, uh, Norman uh, conquest of Ireland, Anglo-Norman conquest of Ireland might be the pinpoint um, where Brit British affairs find their way into the Irish affairs. So this has been a very long-standing issue. And the Irish people are tired, you know, they're resting on a long and tiring 19th century of terrible poverty and mistreatment. Um, so that really does complicate the relationship between British and Irish suffragettes. Um, but more information on this uh, complex relationship between British and Irish suffragettes can be explored on the additional resources tab on our website. Uh, if you click on the article titled Conflicting Interests by Margaret Ward, she gives a very fantastic uh, in-depth analysis of the relationship between these two groups. So just to bring us back to Markovich and Skeffington, I postulate that they represent a duality um, of female activists, one who's concerned first and foremost with the needs of the nation, uh, and one concerned first and foremost with the needs of women. And both seem to offer somewhat logical reasoning for their choices. Uh, you could think like Markovich and say, doesn't it make more sense to first prioritize independence so you can better serve the needs of your nation's women? Uh, or might you think like someone in the mind of Skeffington and say, can a nation really expect to move forward with independence without respecting the rights of half of its population, <laughs> uh, the rights of women? So I want to emphasize again, though, that these ideologies are not mutually exclusive. It wasn't like you had to be one or the other. I think in American politics today, we are under this understanding that, um, you know, to be a Democrat, you can't be a Republican and to be a Republican, you can't be a Democrat. And that's obviously true. But this was not the case for these two movements. Right. Uh, there was a lot of crossover. Uh, and men in the nationalist movement often supported uh, women's advancements in rights to vote and rights in politics as well, despite the inevitable complexities of women navigating an early 20th century political scene. Um, now, this being said, um, it points to a claim that historians make about women constantly needing to be multilingual um, to be political, as in they have to not only be well-versed in the real issues at hand, you know, like you might say, Irish independence, but they're also uh, feeling almost this innate need to look out for the needs of their own sex uh, by at least educating themselves on the issues of suffrage. So uh, this need to be multilingual uh, is talked about by many historians of Irish women, including Sinia Peseta in her book, Irish Nationalist Women from 1900 to 1918. Uh, very interesting uh, points that she makes about women's obligations as political activists. So um, I want to wrap up this lecture by pointing to some of the language in the 1916 proclamation um, that 
was actually read at the beginning of the Easter Rising. So this is part of the document that was read out loud and sparked the week-long uprising of Irish uh, up, uh, Irish rebuking, the Irish rebuking British rule in Ireland. So part of it states that the Irish Republic is entitled to, and hereby claims, the allegiance of every Irishman and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, civil rights, and equal opportunities to all its citizens, and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which has divided a minority from the, major from the majority in the past. So the Irish Republic as an entity, as a political machine, um, essentially desired for men and women to be held under the same standards. After all, they were seen as equal under God, so they should be equal under their government. Uh, the mentioning of Irish women in this text is especially poignant because it's really the first document of its kind to explicitly call for equality between men and women. Uh, we don't observe this in American founding documents, so it's very fascinating to see women specifically in these um, early aspects of Irish nationalist literature. Um, but as we finish up this lecture, I just wanna remind us of the title, uh, Citizens First and Women After. And in response, I would just like everyone to write a journal entry from the perspective of a female Irish activist and how you personally feel about maybe this tug to be multilingual, uh, you know, to be well versed in the nationalist cause and to also have this need to stand up for yourself as a woman um, and how you might feel about navigating that, uh, despite the fact that there's a high chance you're supportive of both movements. So I want you to write from the perspective of an Irish woman in this political scene and just kind of throw in your own uh, perspective and creativity uh, and just be ready to discuss that in our next in-person session. And we will explore more documents of these women who document navigating this issue. Um, we'll look a little bit deeper into Markovich's biography and her pursuits as an activist. Uh, and I look forward to discussing these two ideologies with you in further depth. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this week's lecture, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing your responses. But um, overall, it just demonstrates that Ireland's early 20th century was especially turbulent. So keep those things in mind, and we'll see you guys next week, okay?